Robert Kaplan is the co-founder of First Wealth, a financial planning business based in London. Founded in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, he built First Wealth on the belief that there had to be a better way of doing things. Last year, he also launched Thrive Money, a financial education and well-being platform. On today's episode of Sound Advice Entrepreneurs Unfiltered, we hear how to set up a responsible, purpose-driven business and how planning your finances can help your business stand the test of time. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Thank you, Kate. It's great to be here. So let's dive straight in. What made you start First Wealth in 2008? Why had you become disillusioned with the industry? I suppose there was two factors, two things probably going on there. There there was one from a personal point of view. I was doing this job on my own with just some one support. Um, The financial crisis kind of hit. And I think maybe like a lot of people, I kind of had no idea what was going on at that time. Um, I think generally previous crises, post crises that has kind of happened kind of after financial crisis, you always kind of like knew maybe what the outcomes needed to be or what was kind of going on in the time. At that point in time, I think everyone like had no idea what was kind of going on and it was a really kind of scary place. So from a personal point of view, I really wanted to kind of share this with someone else. So I reached out to Anthony um, and he was kind of like back from traveling and, uh, and was keen to kind of start up a, a business together. So that kind of worked well. But also from a business point of view, I'd grown a little bit kind of disillusioned with the way in which we were kind of doing things. We were just kind of simply investing people's money and the financial crisis brought to light that if I was purely relying on the managing of money, that was kind of out of my control, right? I I didn't cause the financial crisis, right? There was nothing I could have done to kind of predict that or to, to kind of hedge against that. And therefore, I didn't want to be running a business where there was all these external factors which were completely out of my control. So when I was thinking about it, when I was thinking about the relationships and the conversations I had with clients, it was like, right, what am I actually managing? Am I managing money or am I managing people? And actually, what would I rather be doing? And the kind of the the light bulb moment kind of came to me is, is actually I'm really good at managing kind of people and like and helping them kind of achieve their kind of goals, dreams and wishes. And actually, that's a far more fulfilling thing to be able to do and actually it's in my control rather than just simply focusing on the managing the money hence why then first wealth was kind of born Anthony and I set it up together with this whole idea of where and it sounds really obvious so it sounds like why isn't everyone doing this where we thought right we're going to focus on the people rather than the money and by focusing on people rather than money it's almost like you're a kind of financial planner mixed with a business coach in many ways because you really work with entrepreneurs CEOs high net worth individuals to take them on that journey, don't you? Yeah, for sure. So the way in which we kind of describe it, uh, I think you're, you're right, Kate, is, is that financial planner stroke financial coach, it's around helping people see their financial future with extreme clarity. It's about helping them achieve really the one financial goal, which I think every single person in the, in the world has. And that's quite simply to have enough money to live the lifestyle you want without fear of money running out, no matter what happens. And I think what the variable in that is, is is lifestyle. The cost of your lifestyle or the lifestyle you want is different to mine, is different to my family, to my friends. So therefore, the job's got to be about really trying to understand what is it that that individual wants as or that family kind of wants as that kind of life before, quite frankly, we're no longer kind of around in order to kind of uh, enjoy it and do it. So you started out with all these good intentions to really be a very different kind of financial planning business. But I know that a few years into running First Wealth, you felt like things had just gone to back to business as usual. What steps did you take at that time to really reinvent the business? So, yeah, I think that that's exactly right. So we, we, we kind of, when we set up First Wealth, you know, we, we had a big kind of cover on the CityWire magazine and when we kind of launched our new offices in central London and, you know, we were going to be revolutionising financial planning. And I think maybe like a lot of entrepreneurs and business kind of owners, whilst you can kind of talk that kind of big talk, etc., you fall back really quickly into the day-to-day running of your kind of business. And the day-to-day running of a business in order to succeed and kind of to, to make money and to, to pay the bills and, and to kind of do all of this stuff. So therefore, look, whilst we kind of thought, right, we're going to combine a business which does financial planning, investment management and tax planning, 
essentially, when we kind of like looked at this a couple of years in, we were like, all we're really doing is this the same old thing that we were doing previously. We might have dressed it up and badged it up in a kind of different way. Um, and that's because we were just guilty of falling into it, to working a million miles an hour, to kind of working all hours that, that, that we had. We would take on any single client. You know, we were just trying to kind of grow in business. And the problem was is, is the, the business was good, right? Like the, the numbers were great. Like we were growing pretty quickly. And so therefore you're like, well, if this is all working here and we're growing a business, what, why should we do it any differently? But it got to kind of two or three years and Auntie and I looked at each other. One, we were exhausted. Two, we weren't really enjoying what we were doing. Um, and three, we felt that we probably weren't helping our clients as much as we could be. Time and time again, when we're dealing with kind of clients, they're coming to us, me, probably thinking that they're coming to me saying, right, Robert, I've got this issue with my pensions. What do I kind of do? I, I want to get a better return on my money, etc." But actually the real question which they're asking and actually what I was hearing time and time again and I was probably failing to answer was, am I going to be okay? Am I going to have enough money? Can I do all the things I kind of want to do? And yet I was then reverting into, well, let me tell you about Japanese investment grade debt or, or, or whatever it kind of, uh, you know, kind of sub-Asian like high yield bonds or whatever it kind of might be um, and not really kind of answering their questions. So we had this kind of big re-evaluation moment Antti and I went to uh, a conference. We did a lot of learning. Um, it was uh, a conference called Back to Why by a guy called Paul Armisen. Um, and we went to this conference and we heard from other financial planners about the type of way in which they kind of modeled their business. And we came back out of that conference and it was in Birmingham and, you know, it's a two hour odd train journey, including kind of waiting times back to kind of London, an hour and a half or whatever it was. And we literally sat on that train and we mapped out a completely new business to kind of what we had. Um, and we got back to London, we kind of got back into work that week. Um, and we just said, right, let, let's just stop everything here and, and let's just kind of build a business which actually, one, we want to, to be involved with, two, we're really proud of, and three, which we're going to enjoy kind of doing, and four, which we're actually going to make a difference to people's lives. I'm really interested in that re-evaluation process. Um, what tips would you offer other entrepreneurs who are feeling a bit disappointed in the lack of purpose in their business or that they're not quite fulfilling the dream of what they thought the business would be? You know, how do you go back to the why? What steps did you take? How, how did you come up with that new plan on the train? Yeah, so I think there, there, there was a couple of books which we read which were kind of crucial in it all. Um, so Simon Sinek's Start With Why um, it, it was kind of fundamental in that. Uh, Michael Gerber's The E-Myth. Um, again, like these are books which, which probably a lot, a lot of people kind of know, but um, I, I, I didn't know of them at the time. I was switched on to this kind of way of thinking. Um, but I suppose it's just, it, it's about taking that time out. We we literally kind of down tools for kind of a, a week or two. We kind of mapped out everything in which the way in which we wanted everything to kind of work. And then we were like really scared about it all in terms of right, how do we actually start to introduce this? And I suppose that, that was the kind of really scary bit. And I don't really have any more words of wisdom other than just at one point, Auntie and I just said, right, I think we need to stop talking about this and let's just, let's try it. So I went to probably my friendliest client of all, like, you know, someone who I thought, right, that they're not going to completely laugh at me, et cetera. And I was like, right, don't shout me down here, but I want to talk to you. But, you know, they thought we were just going to be doing their kind of annual review. Don't shout me down here, but I want to talk to you about a different way in which we're going to approach these kind of meetings. You know, we're not going to call these annual meetings anymore. We're going to call them financial, uh, forward planning reviews. So actually, we're going to discuss what the life you want to kind of have is, and that's going to form the kind of focus of this discussion. We're going to use some software which we introduced into the business, which is going to help us map out and create a roadmap for your financial future and help you see it with that extreme kind of clarity, which maybe we haven't had before. And only then, once we've kind of discussed you, once we've kind of looked at that kind of roadmap, will we then touch upon your actual kind of money and how we're going to actually fund that kind of plan. So that's it. We, you know, we've kind of built this kind of three rings, which we kind of talked about. And it's really kind of simple in terms of that the process was going to focus on these three areas, financial planning around building this planning and roadmap for your financial future, 
the wealth management, which is how we were actually going to fund that plan, and then financial coaching, making sure you kind of stick to that plan. So it's kind of build it, fund it, stick to it. Um, and actually, the sticking to it is the hardest part because we're all human beings. We're all prone to make mistakes, especially when it comes to investing. Um, you know, I could talk uh, a long time kind of about all, all of that. But it's, again, like that's the kind of value which kind of clients are paying for us all in order to kind of keep them on that track and in order to kind of create that plan. So in like a, a really long-winded way of answering that kind of question, Kate, is, you know, I, I think you need to take time out from the business. You need to kind of formulate that kind of plan. You need to read up on the kind of areas, like I said, that those two books were, were particularly important for me. But then it was just a case of practicing and trying it out. Like I said, I went to my friendliest clients kind of first who I knew weren't going to laugh at me. And actually when they said, oh my God, this is amazing. The only, the only fear, the only problem I did have is, is everyone said to me, why haven't we always been doing it this way? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, but I now know better, so I'm going to do better. And in terms of that shift to your business, did it mean losing certain clients or changing the profile of your clients? Because you said the business was actually doing quite well beforehand. Um, so what did yep. this mean to the shape and projection of your business? Yeah, so uh, I think obviously we, 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 we're a fee-based kind of uh, model company. Um, we, yeah, we, we ended up losing, unfortunately, some of our kind of lower value kind of clients just because the service, because it was kind of, we were working on a kind of fee-based model, et cetera, the value wasn't really there at that kind of lower level in terms of kind of assets, which, which kind of clients kind of maybe had. It wasn't really in their interest to pay it. They could do if they wanted to, but, you know, we had kind of honest conversations with clients and said that maybe that this is no longer the kind of approach to you. And, and I think that that was, unfortunately, some of the collateral damages is that we were unable to kind of work with some of those kind of other clients. But, you know, we had probably just been going at a business where we had literally been taking on anyone in order to kind of grow the business. Um, without kind of actually looking at who we could actually help. And I think this helped us reevaluate, look, that there's certain people, and there's certain people even of higher value who maybe just don't get what we want. I get it, right? That there's certain people, they just want someone who is simply going to run their money. They want to talk about emerging market debt. They want to kind of have these kind of conversations. I can talk to you about it, but uh, you know, I'm qualified to kind of do all of that stuff. It's just I don't think that that's the value which I kind of bring to the table. And what is it that made you get B Corp accreditation and how difficult was that process? I think if you were to ask any business owner or entrepreneur around their kind of business, do you want to do, if you can, do you want to do good with your business? I think you'd be hard pushed. Maybe there are some people, but I think you'd be hard pushed to find anyone who said, no, of course, if I can do good with my business, then great. Yeah, of course I want to. And I think that that was us pre B Corp, right? Like, you know, we were trying to kind of build a value proposition, a value company. We had core beliefs in terms of all of the stuff which we wanted to work here. You know, we had a kind of charity mission. We had these kind of stuff in place, but nothing was really kind of formally documented. And I suppose the B Corp accreditation allowed us to formally document and then be held accountable to these extremely kind of high standards in order to make sure that actually we weren't just the company that talked about doing good and that we actually delivered on it. So that was the kind of driver, I think, behind kind of becoming B Corp is that actually we were now going to be held accountable. And that's because B Corp accreditation is an extremely rigorous kind of process to kind of go through. You know, we probably just over 18 months, uh, we, we kind of, uh, it probably took us to kind of go through it. And we went through every single thing within our business from the accounts to the staff to what toilet paper we're using, right? Like, you know, literally kind of every single kind of minute detail was kind of covered on and looking at the impact that we're making and to make sure that we are now no longer responsible just, well, we are not responsible to our shareholders. We are responsible to our stakeholders. So our stakeholders being our staff, our clients and our community. And so again, that's written in our articles um, you know, it's kind of registered there. We have to kind of commit to that. We have to kind of make sure that we act with their, their interest, the kind of at heart in every single thing which we do. So I think the reason why we did it was just so we could hold ourselves accountable and there was no kind of wiggle room to say, oh, if we don't fancy doing that this month or this year, et cetera, we're, we're not going to kind of do it. And was it something that you and Anthony worked on together or was there someone else within the business that could deal with that really rigorous 18 month process? 
So it was mainly headed up by kind of Anthony, um, and uh, he had a couple of the guys uh, w within the business. One in particular, she's then all with us, Caroline, um, who was like amazing um, at kind of just keeping that on kind of track um, in order to kind of do that. So uh, yeah, no, there's probably more than a one person kind of job, um, but yeah, he headed it up and let loads of the kind of team were involved. We were all involved in kind of discussions around what we wanted the company to look like kind of post the kind of accreditation. And the thing about B Corp accreditation is, is it doesn't end, right? Like, so we're, we're just going through our recertification this year. We, we got accredited uh, about a month into lockdown. So it was actually, it was kind of a, during a period of kind of like, kind of, uh, you know, kind of doom and gloom. Um, it was a really kind of nice thing to be able to kind of get and announce it to everyone. Um, we're now going through our, our reaccreditation and every single, you know, almost the minute we got the accreditation, you know, we formed the B Corp committee within the company. We now have a kind of, I think there's five people in the company kind of work on the B Corp committee. They meet regularly. They have a quarterly outhouse day where they go out of the office um, and kind of plan in terms of all of that. So they're working really hard at the moment to make sure we kind of get our accreditation and not just get our accreditation, but also improve our score from what we got when uh -huh. we kind of were first accredited. And um, you talked about the business's core beliefs, and I know you really champion diversity and inclusion at First Wealth. Can you tell us a bit about your shadow board? Yeah, so again, this is a great example. The shadow board is something which probably Anthony and I had talked about I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. And like, we thought, well, how cool would it be? Like, right, it's actually like, as us as the business owners, and at that time, we didn't really have an actual kind of board. It was basically just me and Anthony. Um, and now we've kind of got, uh, we, we've now got a board of four. Um, we thought, how cool would it be actually to kind of get involved other people within the business and actually to kind of have their ideas and their views and to kind of help them kind of kind of grow our business. Um, but obviously, but then with the introduction of B Corp, it's like, right, that forced us into actually kind of doing it. And it was, again, just one of those ideas we talked about, but then B Corp, when we got accredited, we actually kind of put this stuff kind of in place. Um, you know, again, the... All of the evidence shows us that the more diverse and inclusive a company is in terms of its employees, the more successful it is. So it's like, right, you know, just from no other point of view, and obviously that's not purely the only kind of reason we kind of do it, but it's again, right, if you're like, right, oh, we just, we're, we're evidence-based investors. So all of our investment kind of idea all is based on 100 years of empirical evidence, right? Stuff which you just can't argue with. Um, and it's the same with this. It's like, right, there's this bunch of evidence over here are we just going to kind of continue to be a white male dominated kind of business or are we going to kind of actually kind of do something about it? You know, now our, our senior board is 50% uh, male, 50% female. Um, and again, like in terms of kind of diversity inclusion, um, yeah, the, the, the shadow board is kind of doing great work, not just on that topic, but, but in a whole, a whole host of other areas. And talking of differences, um, I know that you have type one diabetes. Um, how have you managed that condition and has it changed the way that you operate as a founder? I'm, I'm quite active in the, the kind of type one kind of community. Um, there's an amazing charity called JDRF, um, who I do a lot of work kind of with uh, and try to support them as much as possible. They're doing some amazing work. There are some people who will shout about their kind of diabetes and tell every single person that kind of comes into a room that they're a type one diabetic. You can go to the airport and you tell, you can run up to the guys and you tell them, right, okay, I'm type 1 diabetic. I need to be seen kind of going quickly through the airport. I've got needles in my bag and all the rest of it. I'm the type of person, I don't really kind of like to kind of talk about it kind of too much. So in terms of how it's affected me, I, I try not to kind of think about it, which is difficult managing a illness which relies upon constant kind of checking, right? So, you know, I have a thing on my arm, I'm constantly having to scan that to check my kind of blood sugar levels. I'm having to think about every single thing I eat before I kind of inject myself every single day, uh, every single time I eat. I'm taking other injections other times of the day. So th there's a lot of kind of thinking going on about it, but I try not to kind of let it kind of get in my way of kind of uh, like running the business. I don't think it's necessarily changed the way in which I approached it too much, other than just to, to, to maybe be more empathetic with other people who are either going through similar things or other kind of conditions and illnesses. And that's not to say I wasn't empathetic beforehand, but I think, you know, kind of coping with this, et cetera, it, it definitely uh, it, it increases that kind of level of empathy. And again, you know, if I had to describe one trait of a great financial planner, it would be kind of empathy. Absolutely. And also the trait of a great leader. 
in general is empathy and vulnerability. I think so many times you think it's somebody who's brash and confident and has everything right, but that's not always the case. Yep, no, for sure. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I've never been the type of people person that's kind of thought I kind of ever had everything in order. I think diabetes made me realize that I've maybe got to take even better kind of care of myself. So again, like I'm kind of really focused on that in terms of my health and fitness. Um, and, you know, I was quite into it anyway beforehand, but, you know, it, it certainly kind of made me kind of reevaluate kind of things. What am I trying to achieve? You know, I don't think about it kind of in the context of a reduction in like lifespan or anything kind of that, in that kind of context, I believe that, you know, I'm in charge of my own kind of destiny that I can kind of deliver you know, if I keep myself fit and healthy, that then I, uh, you know, I've got as uh, as much chance as anyone. I want to talk to you about when you approach new clients. Um, I know that one of the big misconceptions is that financial planning isn't for entrepreneurs. What is your response to that? You know, it's a really, really cheesy lie, right? But a goal without a plan is just a wish, right? You know, how can you know where your how can you get to where you're going? How can you not, how can you go with anywhere without kind of knowing where you're kind of going to? What, what's the kind of point? What's the point of money? What's the point of kind of growing a business? What are you doing it for? And I think, you know, that is the point of kind of financial planning to kind of help bridge that gap between a business and an individual. So I think so many entrepreneurs, so many business people are so busy running their businesses day to day. So many people have got so much wealth within their business, but personally maybe and maybe very poor, both in times of actual wealth and maybe their time and uh, and their physical wealth and all of the other kind of attributes that go along with that. Um, what is the point of it all? And I think that is what financial planning is, is around, is trying to reframe that conversation to get people in a room, to have these deep, meaningful conversations and to really understand what matters most to you in your life. What is most important? What are we doing here? Because the truth about money is based on one undeniable fact. Life is not a rehearsal. That, you know, that we can't, you know, the challenge which any client should always say to a financial planner, if you're in a room with a financial planner who's just telling you, right, put money into your pension, put money into your ISIS, put money into the, to, to do all of these kind of things. Uh, and just to save, save, save is just to turn around to them and say, well, what if tomorrow never comes? And no one with 100% certainty can tell you that tomorrow is going to come. And therefore, the conversation is about, right, what do we kind of want to do in this next week? What do we want to do in this next month, year, etc.? What's the life which you kind of want to have before either A, you're no longer able to, to, to kind of physically kind of do that or B, you're no longer around to kind of do it. Um, and I think that that's why for entrepreneurs, it's more important than, than, than potentially for, for people who are employed because they're so busy and so focused on their business that maybe they sometimes forget to look up. And actually, I think that maybe you're right that they could maybe kind of invest in a coach. But I think the majority of them kind of won't do this. And I think, you know, again, the conversations which I'm having with, with, with entrepreneurs and business people, you know, time and time again, they're saying, oh, wow, but no one's ever spoken to me this way. My accountant's never spoken to me this way. My lawyer's never spoken to me this way. We've ne I've never been able to kind of be as open kind of in this. You know, we will get into the financial metrics as well. And I suppose that's the, the advantage of not just using a coach. We will get into the kind of financial metrics of kind of how this kind of all pans out and looks. But let's kind of have that conversation first and let's build that plan and show you, right, what if you want to stop work at 50 rather than 65? What if you want to, uh, you know, send your kids to, to private school? What's it look like if you don't do that? What What is the kind of, you know, I'm having this discussion at the moment with my kind of, with my wife is, is around kind of private schools. You know, I didn't go to a private school. She went to a private school. Obviously, it's extremely kind of expensive. You know, when I look at my kind of financial plan, the difference on me potentially sending my kids to private school or not could move the dial on my retirement age or the, the time when I can make work a choice rather than a necessity because I hate the, the kind of word retirement. Um, but it, I, I could make the kind of difference by around eight or nine years. So it's like, right, am I going to be a better parent to my child at 55 rather than, say, 65? You know, maybe at a time, you know, my youngest is uh, my youngest is six, and so maybe at a time when they're kind of 18, like, am I going to be able to kind of help them and kind of be around for them that there, et cetera, kind of during that period of time and be really kind of focused rather than stressing about kind of work and paying off kind of debt? I, I'm not, you know, is that worth it? And again, these are the types of 
conversations you can have. I'm not making judgment on whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. You know, that, that's essentially down to you. But it's like, have you ever thought about it in that kind of context before? And I think the majority of us, and again, every single entrepreneur on this planet will have a business plan, right? Like, so the fact that they don't have a business plan for themselves or their family it, it is kind of mind blowing. So let's dig a bit deeper into some of those conversations. When you first start to build a financial plan for an entrepreneur, what are the first four or five questions you would ask them in that room to map out their future? Again, I can take you through kind of some of the kind of open questions which we kind of start with. So again, this is like, right, what's led you to want to be in this kind of room today? What, what has kind of driven you? Because again, there, there must be some kind of motivator and obviously we can kind of drill down into that. One of my favorite questions also to kind of open with is, is I think, like I said, I, I don't believe in this kind of term retirement. I've seen too many entrepreneurs who I believe will never retire in the kind of a, a official sense of the word. Um, I think it's an industrial age invention, which doesn't kind of exist in kind of today's world. Um, but I think if you were to ask, you know, traditionally a financial planner might say, well, tell me what you want your retirement to kind of look like. Um, and I think for most of us, it's too much of an abstract concept and too far in the future. So therefore, the question which I always like to kind of use, uh, start with is, is, tell me about what your perfect day is. What does your perfect kind of day look like? Because I think that the majority of us, even if we love what we do, that there's probably bits of our job which we don't like doing. So it's like, right, how can we get you to a position where you can just do more and more of the things which you love doing and less and less of the things which you don't like doing? So again, like if you were to ask me, what my perfect day looks like my perfect day would be probably doing some client meetings um you know again some having some great kind of conversation with kind of clients in the morning um it would probably be going maybe to the gym at lunchtime doing some kind of marketing work around kind of first wealth um in the afternoon and then going home seeing my children spending time with family friends etc holidays and all of those kind of types of things obviously my day today currently again i'm a highly regulated kind of business so like the, the paperwork is kind of mind-blowing sometimes um you know and if i could walk out of those meetings and not do any of it like that that would be my kind of dream situation so right you know i'm working on how do i kind of get myself into that kind of position um and i think uh for, for most of us if we can kind of work on that kind of idea what does your perfect day look like rather than what does it look like in you know five years ten years etc again you can kind of use these kind of questions there's some other kind of stuff which you can kind of do is like right again if you were if you went into a doctor's surgery and you were told you only had kind of 24 hours to kind of live, what would you regret that you kind of haven't done in life? What is it that you're not doing at the moment that you would like to be doing, but you think you can't because of financial kind of constraints? Again, these are kind of great questions which kind of open people up in terms of kind of thinking about like, what is it that I want to kind of do before I'm no longer around? Then we can start to work on a plan. We use this tool called Life Goals, uh, which we've kind of developed is kind of we tried to like make this stuff engaging and fun so it's kind of like a tinder style <laughs> um like kind of swipe left swipe right on a deck of cards and it's kind of like the, the problem is 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 some financial planners or no, no let's not talk about that some individuals if i sit here and ask you kate tell me about your goals you'll probably look a little bit like a deer in the headlights because you'll be like oh my god like what, what do you mean what Where do you mean I my start? goals you start panicking <laughs> Exactly. I do like, what should I have goals? Like, what do I, what do I want to achieve in life? Oh my God, like Rob, you just sent me down a like complete existential crisis um, on kind of like what, 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 why I exist. Um, so I think, right, again, we use this kind of tool life goals in order to kind of try and set these kind of goals. It's not perfect because obviously not every single kind of goal can be kind of set within a deck of cards, but we tried to cover off most things and we've split them into kind of different categories um, uh, around kind of the individual, the family, uh, your career and your legacy. Um, so again, we've kind of got kind of four kind of uh, color cards and uh, the, there's loads of different uh, info on each one and you kind of create your kind of life goals in order to kind of do that. And I think unless you're having those conversations, unless you're really kind of getting into that nitty gritty with a client, you probably, and if you, all you're doing is really just focusing in on their money as a financial planner, you're probably not answering the stuff which or helping them with the stuff which they want answers to. I love it that you've created the Tinder for financial planning. It's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you say financial planning makes you better at running a business? I think because I sp spend so much time working with entrepreneurs and business people, like again, I get 
lucky, so lucky in that I get surrounded by like some amazing kind of people, which makes, and again, you take tips and tools and ideas. And, you know, again, these conversations are a great way of me kind of building my kind of knowledge. And I take, try and take a lot of that kind of stuff back to the business and, you know, kind of best of breed ideas, right? These guys are, are doing this. I think that would be kind of really cool things to, to kind of maybe implement within, within First Wealth or within Thrive. Um, and, and so we kind of take, you know, again, I, I think financial planning helps me in that. I think because we spend so much time on the planning stage with kind of clients, rather than just jumping into running their money, it means that as a business owner, we're really focused on our kind of business plan as well. Um, and, and it makes sure that we kind of write that, keep going back to that business plan. We keep on adapting that business plan because like anything, you know, a financial plan is almost redundant by the time you kind of walk out the door. Life doesn't work like a plan. Most businesses' plans don't look like that five, six years on the t in the shot. Obviously, by being a financial planner, by reviewing with people every kind of year and sitting down with them and re you know, reassessing their plan, changing it, adapting it to their kind of life or to their life or to the, to the wider world, um, it means that, again, we, we've become quite good in terms of our skill set at kind of doing this for ourselves as business owners of First Wealth and adapting our financial plan. Why did you launch um, this new financial education platform, Thrive, last year? What sparked that move? B Corp allowed us to actually kind of introduce this. So we set it up originally, it was called Let's Talk About Money and it was on Instagram. Um, and we quickly kind of built up an Instagram following during kind of lockdown. Um, and, and then we kind of pivoted it into Thrive Money um, around uh, 12 months ago now. And it was probably driven out of this existential crisis of do I exist in the world just simply to make rich people richer? Um, and I thought that I've got to exist. Uh, I felt that as a company, we knew too much. We knew how these things were going to should be done. We knew the power of financial planning and that actually every single person in the world could do with a financial, a personal financial plan. But the majority of them can't afford our fees, the majority of financial advisors fees, especially kind of in London. So that's where Thrive Money was born. Jargon free, financial education aimed at people who can't afford to kind of have access to financial advice. So the dream was, is right, how can I help people create a financial plan, which if you come to First Wealth, our starting fee is £2,000 to kind of create a financial plan. How can I do this for under £200? Um, and that was the kind of spark which was like, right, how do we do that? So again, it was digital, online, video course. So we launched our first course around the kind of a month ago. We've got about 150 people kind of going through that at the moment. Um, and it's a 30-day financial well-being course. So again, it's not called financial advice or investment course. It's a financial well-being course. How do we kind of use our money to make our lives happier and better? Um, and I think we, we focus on that. We look at kind of spending habits and we, we look at kind of budgeting. How do you kind of manage debt? How do you maybe start kind of setting kind of goals for your financial future? How do you kind of get yourself kind of organized? Um, and by the end of it, you'll be able to create a one page kind of financial plan, um, which again, like you can then hold yourself accountable towards. It's maybe not quite as good as like having a face to face kind of like interaction or a natural advisor. Again, we talk about that. We've built a community via a, a platform called Circle um, where we've got everyone on there sharing their ideas, sharing their stories. People are realizing they're not alone in this. Um, so again, like the, that kind of community acts as your kind of advisor support kind of like level. We run uh, monthly uh, kind of live chats with a financial planner on board or on those kind of calls where we kind of talk look into a kind of particular topic. Uh, and then people can submit questions and we can try and answer some of those kind of questions for them on that kind of call as well. You said, at times it felt impossible. We have battled online trolls and industry skeptics all while bootstrapping the project from our own funds. Can you tell us a little bit about those challenges and how you dealt with them? Financial education online is really difficult. Partly because we're in a hugely highly regulated kind of business. And therefore, everything which we do is really kind of super scrutinized. So therefore, we're trying to kind of give, I can't call it advice, um, but we, we're trying to kind of give guidance and education to kind of people without giving them actual advice, because I can't give advice unless I sit down and kind of really know the ins and outs of kind of you, you or the individual who I'm 
I'm trying to help there. Um, so I think from the industry, like, again, this hasn't really been done or done on the kind of scale of what we're trying to kind of grow thrive to. Uh, and I think the industry just felt maybe that it couldn't be done. The industry also maybe doesn't want it to kind of be done because they maybe see it as a little bit kind of a threat to kind of face-to-face -face kind of financial planning, um, which is where the majority of the kind of people are working. Um, I think robo advice, which exists, which is, uh, which focuses purely on the investment kind of angle. So again, like robo advice platforms, which you can kind of go on and invest via, um, you know, some of them are kind of great, but they focus purely on the kind of investment angle. They would say though, that that's what people want, et cetera. So they're kind of skeptical around the kind of need for a kind of broader kind of financial education. Um, and then I suppose, yeah, online trolls and like people are just, the course isn't perfect, right? Because it can't be perfect unless you sit down in a room and in, uh, face to face with someone and really kind of go, because we're trying to make something which is suitable for a wide audience, but obviously everyone is individuals, especially when it comes, it comes to their money. Everyone's got nuances, slightly different ways of doing things, slightly different, well, but it could be completely different set of circumstances, yet we're trying to kind of package something up into a course which helps a huge remit of people. So, you know, kind of people, may think that actually you could go and do this stuff yourself or like there's you know things like uh martin lewis's um you know uh, uh website where you can kind of go and look, read up and, and you're right you can do all of these kind of different things i think what we built is very different to that again it's focusing in on financial well-being it's focusing in on financial planning it's using the experience and the expertise of what we've done with thousands of clients at First Wealth and trying to replicate it in an online digital kind of format in a low cost kind of way. And I think that therefore that is different to everything else which kind of exists out there. But again, people will obviously compare it to some of these other things. Some of these other things are free um, and therefore we're charging for this. But again, we try to kind of keep the cost kind of low, uh, as low down as possible. The more people we kind of get on it, the, the lower down we can kind of drive the, those kind of costs and figures. Our, our dream is, is to kind of make financial planning free. Um, and, and, you know, we still provide a lot of, a lot of free content on our Instagram videos, reels, etc. around kind of like loads of different topics. Uh, we do monthly uh, free webinars where we kind of like have 500 people, a thousand people kind of on the calls and we're kind of talking around topics. People are asking questions. So we try and do a lot of kind of free stuff, but, you know, Thrive is a business and I suppose some of the kind of skeptics have kind of come at us uh, a little bit kind of from that angle. Well, it's great how passionate you are about the industry and how you're trying to make it more accessible to everyone. Um, I'm curious to know what does your own personal and professional financial plan look like and what does success mean to you? My own financial plan is, is around building First Wealth to be a company which actually makes a difference in financial planning. So again, right, you know, again, I, I'm very conscious of what our remit is here what our limitations are as well right we're, we're not going to change the world being kind of financial planners but i can definitely change the face of financial planning in this country um and i suppose that that is what success will kind of look like to me a company which has actually kind of grown and actually made a difference to financial planning and to therefore individuals in the uk so therefore if i can change the industry as a whole and get everyone to kind of start doing it this way, that's how we're gonna kind of help as many kind of people as possible. And that's kind of my why of why I kind of exist is, is kind of like to try and help people create confidence for individuals, um, to inspire them with ideas and ultimately give them the freedom to live the life which they kind of want. And that's kind of why I try kind of, uh, you know, that's my own kind of personal why. My financial plan is, is to kind of grow first wealth as much as possible until a time where, you know, we've always talked about this, Anton, I either one, we stop having fun or B, we think we can't actually add any more value or make a difference kind of within the profession. But at the moment, we've got lots of different ideas and, uh, we, you know, we're kind of young enough still just about to kind of keep going. And uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of really excited about the future. Brilliant. Robert, best of luck with your mission. And thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me to take care. You can find out more about First Wealth and Thrive Money online and you can connect with Robert on LinkedIn. We're going to be taking a short break to recharge, but we'll be back soon with more raw and real stories from Sound Advice Entrepreneurs Unfiltered.